of you that have been brave enough to stay to the end will instantly recognise that I am both younger and more attractive than John Hertzma, who was supposed to be, to be running this session. And it's, it's my task to um, introduce, well, you, you've already met our illustrious panel, to, to moderate question from them. I've been told that we mustn't keep you from the drink. So we're just going to go for, for half an hour rather than the uh, scheduled 45 minutes to catch up a bit on time. So who'd like to ask the first question? Let me get you a microphone. <laughs> Turn him down. He's not allowed. <laughs> if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes, yes. Hello, it's uh, Tom Adams uh, here from CGI. Uh, there are lots of candidate data sets that would benefit from this approach. And I think uh, in the NHS, all the registries would be perfect examples of that. So the renal registry, cancer <coughs> registry. Is the Open EHR Foundation talking to the NHS about perhaps moving to this sort of platform approach? I'll let you have this. <laughs> <laughs> I might even bounce it to you. <laughs> I'm just coordinating. Yes. I wouldn't say we're talking to them, but they're, in, they're listening. Are you talking I, to them? I, I, don't, I, I would say it was talking at them, yeah. They are, they, I think, increasingly aware through events like this, the one in Salford, that there is actually some real traction. I think for a long time, um, certain aspects of, of the NHS in England regarded as, we don't do this kind of data sharing. We do interoperability between systems. And this kind of platform approach should not be part of our remit. But that's starting to change. I wish it was. At a, at a meeting just a couple of days ago at the Interopen Board, there were certainly you know, people, senior people from, from NHS Digital and NHS England, and I could hear the conversations, we have to do something about this open EHR thing. Now, that could, you could take that two ways, <laughs> but I think we're now a thing, you know, where before we were a kind of, you know, this has momentum and legs. The target, well, I heard a, a, a presentation by someone involved in the, the target architecture work who talked about the open platform as, at least for some parts of the country, a perfect fit, you know, where there wasn't necessarily some legacy application that could pick that up. So yes, I think we're getting close. OK. Can I? Robin. I'm getting old now, so I can remember a, a long history of standards, even reaching back to Edifact, if anyone <coughs> is old enough to remember that. So, um, I, and, of, and also healthy, healthy scepticism lives in my body, but it's a healthy scepticism alongside a lot of enthusiasm as well. So, uh, there are a lot of standards around. We've talked about DICAM HL7, the IHE, XDS, and FIRE. I, actually, my training is a, of a mathematician, and I can see the common problem that they're all solving. And I think there's a kind of convergence of these. I wonder if the panel would like to talk about the possible convergence of these standards. Who wants to kick off on that? Dream on. Oh, Tom. <laughs> well, Tom. I, I used to go to standards meetings a lot, you note the past tense. So I gave up in. Um, 2007 or something like that. I used to go to HL7, uh, SEN, so that's the pan-European one. Um, and I kind of, you know, I've spent years, along with many others, you know, people like Graham Grieve and all these guys and doing fire and everything, looking at, you know, how can we harmonise, harmonise, you know, this beautiful world, word, uh, you know, HL7 V3 and open air and blah, blah, blah. And business types would walk into rooms and say, oh yes, when this is done, when this harmonisation is done, we're just adopting in the hospital, as if it were something that could be done in a little three-month time box. Yeah. Now, over at least three years that I you know, spent looking at it, and I tend to work in a mathematical mode, it was very clear to me that we were never, ever going to harmonise HL7 V3 with Open Air or SEN 13606, uh, not to mention ASTM, um, uh, CCR, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, <coughs> the reason, the, the difficulty with harmonising, just as a principal thing, is different underlying design concepts. So, in other words, different basic semantic primitives in your um, information models. I suppose. I mean, the domain-level information <coughs> models. 
So I'll just give you an example of something that's kind of, you know, a little bit of difficulty. In open air, there's a type called observation that allows you to represent some data for most observations, including, you know, time-based samples and complex data structures. In HL7, you'll find, well, HL7 V3, you'll find an ACT class and you'll find an observation um, refined class. In FIRE, you'll find an observation. Go and have a look at them, all of those things, really carefully, which is a kind of, you know, head-wrecking exercise. You stare at the screen and look at all the, you know, the fields and what do they mean. So it takes time and you'll see, you know, your heart will slowly be sinking because you'll think, well, hmm, they've put this here and then there's these message-related things here and there's a little bit of workflow stuff here and it goes on and on like that. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. Actually, it, it's quite possible. The thing that makes it possible is if you say, yeah, but I just want to do, you know, a simple sequence of blood sugars. And then you go, ah, the fire version of that is I can wipe out most of these attributes here. I only need these three. The open air one is I need these few over here. Um, I mean, you can do the same thing for other types of standards. And then you can do, you know, use case specific mappings and <coughs> you can do it for real. You can build a little, you know, fire based app that sucks out some open air data for a time series of blood sugars, sure. The only problem is that is, and that's probably what we're going to be doing for the foreseeable future. The problem is scalability, and it's always just a linear cost of the more you do, the more it costs. There's no um, generic engine you can write that will convert, you know, in the old days, the idea of converting, say, 13606 or open EHR to CDA, for example. Uh, you just have to do these specific mappings. So that's kind of the way IHE works. Each use case is its own, you know, little 28 page specification with every single field of HL7 V2.5 or whatever mapped out for that use case. And then you go to a different use case and it's a whole other IHE um, profile. To get out of that, we have to get into what I, you know, call single um, source semantic modeling. So we're already doing it more or less with terminology. There's only one SNOMED, you know, there's bad bits in it, but it's, you know, it's a good idea and it's roughly right and it's getting better because the ontologists are finally being allowed to fix it. <coughs> there's only one LOINC. It's got its bad bits and, you know, <laughs> you can love or hate the multi-axial terms, but, you know, everybody kind of agrees that it's quite good. We need to do the same thing with somatic models for microbiology result for, for, you know, all the vital signs for all the perinatal types of examinations and notes and so on for the whole of medicine. That's when that problem will be solved. So I would see this as a, a kind of political question at one level. So that's a short answer that probably didn't even answer the question, but that's the level of difficulty we're talking about. Ian, you want to? I, yeah. Oh, so yeah, I'm on. Yeah, I, I think I would never disagree with Thomas. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'm not going to disagree because I think actually that, that I, I agree with the headline thing is let's not try to harmonise. We don't need to. We have a set of, I think, IHD, XDS, Fire, Open Air, SNOMED and probably a bit of LOINC. I think that's going to happen. Has got more, we've got all the parts there. They don't all fit seamlessly together, as Thomas suggested. But I think within the constraints and our ability to actually do anything at scale, we can make it work and get things happening over the next few years and who knows what will happen down the track. What we shouldn't do is aim for the moon and say we cannot do anything until this all works seamlessly together. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Or take the next question. <laughs> Thank you, Ewan. Ian Thompson. I'm a GP in Scotland and an e-health advisor in Scotland, NHS Scotland. One of the things that I picked up from today is the importance of having clinicians help inform the models that these information models that we're doing. How do we encourage greater participation from grassroots clinicians in the process of um, defining and refining these sorts of models? Since you're Scottish, it should be easy for Scotland, right? It's very easy. <laughs> <laughs> The, the chief modeler is Scottish, so I'm pretty sure that <laughs> at least. I, I'll go quickly and let someone else come in. I, the, there are two challenges. One is people understand, 
the, the authorities' understanding that this is important, and the second is clinicians' understanding is important. We're getting there again. Things like the Digital Academy, things like the Interop Summit, people are starting to understand that there is an enormous deficit in informatics knowledge. In, in this country and many others. And that's the thing we have to fix. Then we will get enough people coming through. And even if it's just a tiny little contribution to say that tiny little bit of an archetype is wrong or you've missed the thing that I need, that's all I'm going to say in the subject. You'll never see me again. That's what we need. We don't need vast ranks of clinicians contributing. No, I would also say that it's an education and promotion thing. And um, <clears throat> I suppose it's promoting and uh, educating people in a language that they're going to understand, if that's not yeah. being too patronising, yeah. because yeah. I think all too often, you know, I mean, some of the concepts we've, we've talked about and heard today are actually quite esoteric, mm -hmm. uh, you say the least, and therefore, you know, back to engaging, you know, the normal clinician on the ground, uh, who, who day in and day out is working with uh, real life situations. How, how do they get themselves to a place where they really understand this agenda and the importance of it and their part to play in it, I guess, is a, is a key consideration. Okay, Rick. Right. Sorry, you, I know I bang on about it. But we're still not patient-centered. We're professional-centered with the patient as part of the professional picture. And I think that we're at, there is only one place where we can actually start having universal standards going for tiny fragments of things that the patients know about themselves, which needs to be, for example, a trading standard should be, I, on this date, at this hospital, with this number, by this surgeon, because of this simple problem, had a hip operation, and this was the method of his hip operation, this is the outcome, uh, long-term problems, just as a tiny fragment about me. And if that can be standard with public pressure, and trading standards, we've actually got the potential next of kin is something you can actually make as a fragment. My eyesight, my hearing, my mobility, my, the fact I've got a denture, yes or no, and a wig, yes or no, and an implant, yes or no. All the things that patients know, they know a hell of a lot. I started in computing by asking pregnant women to enter data themselves. I did 100 consecutive patients in Leeds, and 45 of them would prefer answering their questions on a computer about their antenatal history instead of a midwife. 45, or, uh, 46 would rather have a midwife, and I think nine didn't know which. And we've not made use, every other industry makes use of data entry by the client. Every industry, except healthcare. No, we know better, we're professionals. a real need to do that as well, especially in, in the registry situation where we are in. Um, um, we have year after year, we have the fragmentation. Uh, one of the most important things is, is the patient still alive? <laughs> well, the patient could tell you if he's still alive. <laughs> he, he couldn't tell you if he's dead, but he at least could tell you if he's alive. And uh, I think with the things that Thomas showed already, you know, the, the patients that are having these Fitbits and these so things that are... Up. Up. Yeah, I found a problem with battery. <laughs> it's like my, my, my weighing machine doesn't work anymore because it doesn't work with the new Apple. My blood pressure machine doesn't work. I can't afford to keep buying new equipment. No, but you can do... You can, you can use that or you can have your telephone or, or yeah. just... just should, we, should, we, should, we, should we move on with another question here from Sarah? Um, thank you. I think looking at today um, and the previous event we had in Manchester, um, there's more than enough evidence to consider open air for a lot of systems implementation. Um, I would like to know what the members of the panel think um, about open air claiming a place in um, the messaging space by, you know, using as a pure messaging specification. Where do you see it in comparison to the alternatives at the moment? Well, I, I mean, I can, I can answer for uh, a number of projects that we did, uh, and uh, we've actually used it, uh, the archetypes uh, and, and messages generated from archetypes in a lot of projects, 
but it is safe to say we didn't have uh, systems that could produce other standards uh, um, like um, HL7 or stuff like that to deal with. So in Slovenia, we didn't have, uh, except for the labs, uh, HL7 is, wasn't very popular. So we could propose the standard. And of course, since the centralized repository was uh, OpenEHR based, it was much easier. And to the vendors, it didn't make a difference. They had to implement <coughs> something anyway. So that's the easy one, I guess. It's Greenfield. Moscow is doing something similar. Uh, but of course, where you do have uh, existing systems or, or products that actually have standard outputs, you just have to make this transformation at one end or the other. And it usually depends on the case. I mean, Ian is very active in this space. So but there's, there's this interesting, and I'm going to make this work now. Um, because <laughs> There's this case for a lot of projects where implementing, say, fire is mm. still greenfield because mm. they don't have fire integration mm. at the moment. So, Ian, mm. honestly, you know, there are good, good things about that as well. If you were to compare fresh implementation for messaging based on mm. fire and open air, how would you see the pros and cons? It's down in the market. I'm sitting right next to I know you are. I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking, at, I'm looking at my good friend John Meredith from, from uh, NWIS, who has what we've decided to call the genius scribble, um, which shows I think it's just a mixed economy. It's down to the market. You know, whether, whatever you think of the technologies, Fire, you know, HL7 V2 is in a lot of places, V3 is still hanging around some places, and Fire is going to be there in a lot of other places. And, you know, John and many others, same in Scotland, we're going to have, p implementers will make the choice. Do I want to go through the fire route? Because if you like, that's a bigger market, but it's maybe more simplistic, it won't do everything. Other cases, I will go deep and have the tighter integration, the sort of thing they're doing in Plymouth. So I think it's just going to be mixed. Maybe John wants to tell, tell the world himself about the... Uh, Sooner or later, I was going to speak about this, wasn't I? <laughs> um, I suppose the thing I want to add to that, uh, and coming off, you know, the the, the clinicians on fire um, event that, that that happened yesterday, was the concept of this or the comment about the hype cycle, the hype, the fire hype cycle, and everyone asks, you know, how, you know, are we over the curve yet, and things like that. I think what seems to be happening in the open air space is demonstrable progress by these projects that seem to be taking off, and I think. We don't want to put our hat in the ring and compare ourselves to fire in that regard because we'll just shoot ourselves in the foot. We'll develop our own hype cycle, and before you know it, we'll be turn into a talking shop. Um, you know, for for NHS Wales conceptually, this genius diagram, as we start to call it, I, I don't want to call it the genius diagram anymore. Actually, it's, it's too too much pressure. Um, it basically is just it's just reflecting on use cases. If we've got locally uh, derived apps, you don't want to put a middleman in there. Don't put a fire facade around it. Just go straight into a CDR, use the, use the open air uh, APIs that are there. But of course, if we've got a centralized you know, data repository that exists and we need to send a message to another app or what we've got a vendor, use fire for it. It's horses for courses, use case specific. And I don't think we need to get more hung up about that, to be perfectly honest. Oh, I might try and add a little a little bit more. It's not even just use case specific, it's about whether the systems that you want to connect are transparent or opaque. That's the decider. <coughs> opaque systems aren't, you know, usually commercially or at some mm. level that's above the actual technology, ain't going to let you know what's really inside them. So you sit around and go, gee, what will we do? I know, we'll invent a message definition that says, um, well, look, just be nice to us fill out one of those messages every time the result is made and we'll accept that and we, you know, we'll live with it. You're never going to let us see what's inside your database. So that's a opaque system as a data source. So that's kind of why there is, you know, HS7 V2 and V3 and all these, you know, Edifact and messaging. If your system is um, transparent, in other words, it's quite happy to advertise what sort of data and today, of course, we're talking about behaviours and services are inside it. You don't need any messages. Back in 1988, me and you know, anybody else who did engineering back then, I was in real-time systems, we had a tool called RPC Gen, which allows you to generate the client and the server uh, code stack for an advertised piece of data 
um, and simple uh, functions that were on computer A, you could run RPC gen, which generated this code, you could compile it with the normal C compiler, and voila, you ran your client program on computer B, it interrogated computer A, how did it do that? It just used the code that RPC gen generated. RPC gen just ran off an IDL, interface definition language specification <coughs> of what was being advertised in computer A. So that's transparent <coughs> system advertising what I have inside me, especially if it's standardized, like it's really standardized, you know, globally speaking, then you don't need any messages. So the world that we're probably moving towards in my view, at least the platform world, is one of transparent content and transparent systems who aren't, that aren't trying to hide what's inside them. Then you just generate messages technologically. Uh, these days it's with you know, Google Protobuf, Proto3 I think, and there's about 50 other protocols, all binary, or you, know, you can use REST or whatever. But you don't need to do any handwriting of messages. It's just that in health, we've got a majority of giant vendor systems, generally speaking, which are in the, in the opaque camp. And that's where you start thinking, gee, we've got to use something like fire. But I would just say one thing, and you know, people can shoot me now. Um, starting from single source modeling, i.e. archetypes and templates, we could build an entire catalog of messages for everything to use. So I'll just put that out there to entertain a few people. <laughs> I take one more question. Who would like the last word? <laughs> Mark. Hi, uh, Mark England. I'm coming from more of a sort of system transformation perspective and looking at trying to procure an open platform um, within an SDP. We've got three GDEs looking at the architecture we might need. and. Um, it's just, I wouldn't mind some reflections on how mature the market is. I've seen Marand and I've seen the maturity. It's gone a lot more since I heard about it, about seven, eight years ago when I last looked at it. And it's a question of, you know, that I saw Ribble and do you think there's a market developing for a, you know, a good response to a tender in this domain? Well, first of all, it, it depends on what you're looking for. So there's, uh, there's a clear separation between applications that run on top of OpenEHR, platforms, tools, uh, we saw CDS, things like this, right? So I couldn't say today that in each one of these categories you have huge choice. But uh, as s I think there was one presentation that alluded that they did uh, find three, four vendors that could comply with the specification, with the requirements specification for at the platform level, which is probably the key, the key one. So are there as many as we would like? No. I mean, uh, first of all, they're globally distributed. We have people in Australia. China was mentioned, uh, Norway, uh, Netherlands, Netherlands uh, now a UK ver version of uh, an open source <coughs> one. So is it, uh, you know, is it a developed market where you can have huge choice? No, not yet. <coughs> But I think with uh, events like this, and especially with cases proving the value, this will definitely come. Uh, but on the other hand, I think there is enough. You know, there is enough choice. And the vendors are all complying with the spec, so that means if something better comes along down the line, you can actually swap it out and replace it. And that's the premise of OpenEHR. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, so. Um, is it good to go? I would say yes. I mean, uh, in, in the, the examples that you saw here, with, without exception, are all stuff that's being used, okay, that's in place. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the criteria for choosing them to, to present. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree entirely with that. Um, but also to say, I get regular calls as in my co-chair role saying, from big companies and small companies saying, we'd really like to build an open air CDR. How do we start? And I usually say, don't. Um, go and use one of the existing systems, whether open source, closed source, get your head around it. And then a few years down the road, when you've got your head around the paradigm, because it's a bit unusual, and you've got the engineering team, go for it. So we just saw the start of that in China, you know? And they probably won't ever come to this part of the world, because they've got a big, big market there. So I don't think they will 
necessarily particularly throw themselves into, into our, our world. But I would be pretty sure within three or four years, you guys will have quite serious competition. Oh, and they're, it's there already, but I know waiting in the wings, people are getting their heads around the, the technology. Yeah, and, and you know, what, what um, well, go ahead, go ahead. Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so we had this procurement process like uh, one and a half years ago, two years ago uh, now, uh, and at that point we were comparing uh, Morant against uh, a lot of closed source CDSs, uh, closed platforms, um, and then when you look at that, it's th it, it it didn't really make sense not to choose an open platform, and then you can choose which ones are very uh, mature or uh, or less mature. But I always thought uh, when we choose that. Okay, we are in a sort of a pioneering phase here. We're doing something, uh, doing something different. And uh, what is better than to get on board with a with a company that that drives that change and is going to and we are going to evolve with them in that direction. And I think um, uh, there are a number of companies out there that could do that. So, uh, we choose them around, of course, but they're also in our region. <laughs> let, let me just add to that that it, it is a funny world. You know, there is actually a case where we as a company have helped another company build a competing product. Now, this doesn't happen very often in other <laughs> industries. But of course, for us as a vendor in the open space, we need to make sure that we are not the only vendor, because it's not very open if there's only one. So this is, this is the first point. And I definitely think the competition in the future will be on the tools, not on the platform itself. I mean, not on the storage and, uh, and back office, right? because uh, that's the, the piece that will make this much more usable and cheaper to implement and you know, all the other benefits of, of what we're trying to do here. And if I've, I'm absolutely sure if we had these tools today, we would have, well, this place wouldn't be big enough, uh, you know, because the market is really hungry for, for uh, good tools to build applications, and if it's on an open platform, so much the better. Uh, today, I always joke that uh, we've, we've gone across and we've pretty much uh, gotten a lot of the early adopters, right? So what we're doing now is basically trying to go for the mainstream customers who are risk averse, especially in healthcare, right? So the fact that we can show 10 cases uh, of very different applications uh, uh, working uh, with this technology uh, is actually trying to prove to these customers that it is mainstream now and that it's safe to use. Uh, I'll just quickly add, I think that procurement thinking needs to change in this country, at least in, I forget who mentioned the 80%, like not the EPIC sort of CERNA group, but everybody else. Um, no, I don't mean, I mean it in a sincere way, right? Uh, because it's a bit of a phase change in the physics sense, you know, water and ice, to go between, right, what giant system am I going to spend 30 million pounds or even 300 million pounds if you're, you know, certain places on, or the phase change is, oh, hang on, I could buy pieces of things. I could buy some horizontal services that would fit together and incrementally buy, you know, this decision support thing and this scheduling thing and, and whatever. Now, to get from that first situation to the second is that's we're, we're in that process somewhere. And I don't just mean for open air. There's a lot of platform stuff going on. We're in a technological change over to horizontal layers and, and <coughs> middleware services and little thin, nicely constructed UX experiences on beautiful, shiny devices. Um, I would suggest that in the UK, you know, CIOs and well, everybody else to do with purchasing and procurement needs to be sort of talking about this phase change and, you know, talking about, well, who's, you know, what are we going to do about it? Maybe if somebody, you know, stands up and says, well, this is what we're doing about it in Plymouth and here's the result so far and somebody else stands up for leads, et cetera, et cetera, you know, there's going to be a, an evolution of thinking and the thinking has to come in how do we buy solutions? The evolution, I mean, it has to change, doesn't it? If it's still like, what giant thing are we going to buy? Well, they've just already kept away the whole possibility of doing something incremental and cost-effective and horizontal platform-based. So, 
you know, I think CIOs and there needs to be a sort of social mechanisms for people to get together, the right kind of people in the NHS to have the right kind of conversations and to be proactively thinking about this topic. And that'll help. And, you know, they can come back and say, well, open air, not bad, you know, but you need to fix X, Y and Z. I can't wait to hear stuff like that from those kind of people. You know, let's do it. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll wind it up there. Um, if I could, on behalf of Moran, thank all of our speakers, the audience of, who stayed to the bitter end. M Moran for organising and paying for it all, I think. So if we could thank all those people. <laughs> and I think the drinks are outside, aren't they, Thomas? Yeah, there's drinks outside. Thank you. Thank you.